Let us confess our sins together. Loving God, you have bestowed upon us rich and abundant blessings, the greatest of which is the full forgiveness of sins and the indwelling Holy Spirit. Yet rather than rejoice in the giver, we often spend our gifts selfishly. Our lives have become thin, without worship, without joy, without courage, and without love. We have sought to build our identity on the things and people of this world, on approval, acceptance, talent, charisma, performance, intelligence, manipulation, wealth, and power. This is grasping at the wind. At the same time, God, we have too much believed the voices of criticism and thought the setbacks encountered render us without hope and without your favor. Forgive us, Lord. Help us stop seeking to be for ourselves what only you can be for us. Renew us in the grace that abounds to the brokenhearted. Turn us away from all self-salvation strategies. Return us to your loving embrace. Remind us of the full salvation purchased by our sacrificing elder brother, the Lord Jesus Christ. Grant unto us the joy of our salvation. Now let us go to our Lord in silent confession. Now receive this assurance of pardon and comfort from Romans 5.17. If because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in the life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Greetings in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit on this Lord's Day Sabbath. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you and give you peace. Amen. Let's pray. We thank you now, God our Father, for your goodness to us. We thank you for the blessed life of your Son, Jesus Christ, that you foreordained us to have before the world was created. And in faithfulness and in great power, uh, Jesus Christ came into the world. Your Son, being born of Mary the Virgin, of her flesh, being conceived by the Holy Spirit in her womb. God and man, one person, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who undertook for our poor sakes a life of humility, a life of suffering, and in obedience, a death of the utmost inconceivable suffering on the cross, taking upon himself our sins and all the horror of your punishment. We are grateful that the Holy Spirit upheld your son when he was on the cross, kept him from fainting in his, in his humanity. Blessed Holy Spirit, we thank you too for bringing his life to us through the gospel. And we pray now that as uh, the, this word is preached that, that, that uh, it would be blessed uh, with power and um, effectiveness. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, last Lord's Day, we learned that persevering in faith and obedience to Jesus Christ is not always an easy thing to do in this world. Many people know this far more than we do because they are suffering far greater than we are, even to the point of death in different places in the world. Nevertheless, for all Christians, we, we don't give up. We don't quit our persevering in faith and obedience because the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, awaits us. The life and the rewards to come are worth whatever we might have to face in this world. This, today I'm going to talk more about this everlasting life that God promised before the world began. I have a number of points. The first one is that in verse 2, um, where we see in verse 2 that God did indeed promise everlasting life to the elect. And he promised this before time began or before creation. The truth or we could say the reality behind this statement of God promising this before the world began, is that God the Father promised his Son, a people of his own, to be a people uh, beloved by the Son and brought to the Father by the Son, people whom the Son would redeem by becoming a man and suffering and dying on the cross in their place for their sins, to bring them into the joyful fellowship that he has with his Father. Many theologians call this promise a covenant of redemption, which the Father made with his Son before time began. Now this might be a new idea, or the, the phrase covenant of redemption may be something new to you, but we see it, or we see the idea of it, I suppose we should say, in Scripture. For example, in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10, Isaiah says, and speaking of Christ, 700 years before Christ came, Isaiah the prophet said, it, is, it was the Lord's will to crush him. Notice he used the past tense, it was the Lord's will. Speaking of something that had already, as if it had already taken place before it did take place. So sure of it was, was it that it would happen. Isaiah says, it was the Lord's will, looking, looking into the future, the prophet. It was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring, his people, and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. Isaiah speaking of Christ dying to redeem his people, the people given to him by the Father before the world was created. But Isaiah's voice isn't the only voice in Scripture to speak of this promise. There are numerous other places in Scripture, particularly in the New Testament where, we, where, where it's mentioned. We find it in Ephesians, Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, 
chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, which say, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, for he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. <clears throat> we also find it stated in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, with these words, He saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us before the beginning of time. And Paul really is emphasizing there uh, that it's not something we, we earned or that we could earn. It's something God gave us, as he says, before the beginning of time, before we were even born, before anything existed. This grace was ours. The Lord Jesus Christ himself even speaks of, of this uh, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 35, with these words, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. And furthermore, in John chapter 17, verse 2, Jesus said that he will give eternal life to all those whom the Father gave him. And then in John 17, 6, Jesus said that he revealed the Father to those whom the Father had given him out of the world. And then we also have the Apostle Peter, who in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, says that he wrote his letter to men and women who had been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled by his blood. And then there is the Apostle Paul once again, who in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, wrote, Those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, Jesus Christ. Now let me take a moment and a moment or two and talk about the words foreknowledge and foreknew, which the Apostles Peter and Paul used when they referred to the elect. These words, foreknowledge or, uh, and foreknew, tell us that God the Father knew ahead of time, knew everyone, I should say, ahead of time, that he wanted to, be, to belong to his Son. He knew them before they were created, and he predestined them to belong to Christ, his beloved Son, and, and to be in fellowship with himself through Christ. As it says in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, in love he predestined us to adoption as sons. And again, sons meaning we all share equally in the inheritance. In love he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. He loved us before we were born, before we were created, before there is anything but God. And this is a mystery to us how God would love us before time. And in that love, uh, he saw us, he chose us, he loved us in Christ before time began. And it says, he did this according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he has freely given us in Christ, the one he loves. Now, neither Paul nor Peter wrote that God foresaw or that he saw ahead of time those who would believe in Christ. And then based on what he foresaw, what he foresaw people doing, that is putting their faith in Christ, he then chose those people. That's not what they say. They don't use the word God uh, foresaw or he says they use the word foreknowledge or foreknew. So what they're saying is that Election to everlasting life through Christ was because the Father knew the elect in a state of grace in Christ before time. As Paul again says in Ephesians 1.4, he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. 2 Peter 1.9, this grace was given to us before the world or before time began. Marvelous words that ought to 
just cause us to be in awe of God and not just of his love, but of his great power and ability and his, his shall I say, sovereignty in choosing whomever he wants to choose and, and chose whomever he wanted to choose to receive grace through Christ. Paul talks about this in depth in Romans chapter nine. And of course, uh, it all boils down to these words, I suppose. God says, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. It's, he is free to choose. And we mustn't think God is unfair. God is God. Whatever he does is good. Whatever he does is right. He is a God to be feared. And he is a God to be worshiped in fear. And secondly, in Titus chapter one, verse three, Paul, Paul wrote that God has brought this promised, predestined eternal life to light through the preaching of the gospel, which God had entrusted to Paul and the other apostles. This word, English word entrusted is a, is a um, why does the word all of a sudden escape me? Uh, it means when the subject is acted upon as passive. <laughs> it's a passive verb in Greek, meaning that Paul didn't attain to it. It was, it was given to him as part of the grace uh, that God had, uh, had given him in Christ before the world began. And Paul, who was once a murderer of Christians, one of the foremost persecutors of his age, uh, never ceased being amazed at this grace that had been predestined for him and that he actually received in time uh, in his life. This gospel, this message that he at one time hated and wanted to stamp out uh, out of all existence in the world, wherever it was found, he was entrusted with it and he was so grateful to be the bearer of this great message of salvation. Uh, we can relate to Paul. I don't think uh, any of you out there who are hearing me have been murderers of Christians, although I don't know, but maybe you have committed some other crimes, not against Christians, but against others, maybe murder, maybe abortions, a number of abortions, uh, perhaps all kinds of sexual immorality, embezzlement. Who knows what it could be? You are not outside of the, re the reach of the grace of God. If, if Paul could have it, so could you. Don't lose hope. Look to Christ always. That's where grace is found. That's where it comes. That's where it comes to you from heaven through Jesus Christ. Now, Paul didn't mean when he said this promise of everlasting life that God had made before time that it when he said it came to light through the preaching entrusted to him, he didn't mean that this promise was unknown before he and the other apostles began to proclaim it to the world. No, as a matter of fact, the promise was revealed right after Adam and Eve sinned and brought death upon themselves and the human race. We see this in Genesis chapter 315, where Paul said that a seed of the woman would smash Satan's head. And get, get this, my friends, the scriptures don't say the seed of a man and a woman. Just the seed of a woman. We might think, well, that just includes the seed of a man or, or, or a man and a woman uh, through would, would, uh, would procreate and then would come this, their, their, the offspring they engender would be a savior. That's not what the text says. It's he just, the Holy Spirit speaking, it would, he would come from a woman. No one else fits this in all history, but Jesus Christ, born of the Virgin, conceived in her womb by the Holy Spirit. Paul says in Galatians, that uh, and when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, the son of God, being born into this world, taking upon himself full humanity so that he could suffer and die in our place. Now, going back to Genesis 3.15, this, this promise of the eternal life to come by the destruction of evil, by the seed of the woman, it told the people in Old Testament days that the Savior would be a flesh and blood human being with a human mother. Then in Genesis chapter 15, 
God promised that this same person would be a descendant of Abraham. And then later in the Old Testament, it said that he would also be a descendant of King David of Israel. Jesus Christ fits the bill, if, if I may put it that way. He was all these things. Jesus was also uh, prefigured by the sacrificial system of Israel's religion. And he was spoken of by the prophets in the Old Testament. So the Old Testament gives us a picture of Christ. It, 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 it points to him, but it's a shadowy picture. We don't see him, ex we see him, but not all the details that the apostles would later reveal to us in their preaching. And this is what Paul did. By his preaching, he made the picture clear. He said that the Old Testament pointed to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who became a man to bring his people, the elect, all the people that the Father had promised him before time began, he became a man so that he could bring them out of darkness and Satan's dominion and into new and everlasting life. Jesus Christ himself called Paul to proclaim this message. As I said, Paul used the Greek passive uh, voice in his verb, entrusted. That's how we translate it. It was entrusted to him. He, was, he wasn't looking to preach the gospel, my friends. He was looking to eradicate it. Then Jesus Christ appeared to him to give him the grace that Paul had been predestined to have before time began, a grace that would come to him regardless of his life and how horrible a person he was. And here are the words that the, that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke to Paul when he called him, to, when he entrusted the message to him. We find it in Acts chapter 25, verses 16 through 18. Jesus said, I have appeared to you, Paul, uh, to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people. Paul was hunted and, uh, and, and people tried to murder him after he became a Christian and started preaching the gospel. Jesus said, I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And Paul went out to proclaim this message. It's this message and this one alone that saves the elect, the offspring promised to the Son of God before time. When they hear this message, they hear this gospel, they, they hear the voice of their Savior inviting them to come to him to receive the grace that they were chosen to have. And the Holy Spirit takes away the heart of stone that they have being fallen in Adam. And he takes away their unwillingness. He, he gives them new spiritual life, making them able and willing to receive what Jesus offers them. And then thirdly, one of the people who responded to Paul's preaching was a man named Titus. Paul addressed him in verse 5 as my son in our common faith. This means that Paul, I think it's verse 5, maybe it's verse 4, but he, said, he addressed him as my son in our common faith. This means that Paul shared the gospel with Titus and led him to Christ, as we say. Paul then became Titus's teacher and helped him grow uh, deeply in Christ and to be a minister of the gospel. Titus was such an effective minister that he traveled with Paul to bring the gospel to new places. One of these places was, the, was Crete, an island in the eastern part of the Mediterranean Sea in the area of Greece. Then after winning many people to Christ by their preaching, uh, Paul went elsewhere to, to, to continue to preach and he left Titus in Crete to finish organizing the Christians into churches. And he would do this by appointing elders for them in the various towns where they lived so that they could be governed, so that they could be organized. We see this in verse five. And that's, a, that's an exegesis, an explanation of what we see in, in Titus chapter one, verses one through five. Let me finish now uh, by saying that I, I, I'll, I'll continue, I hope to continue, 
uh, the Lord willing, on this theme of elders and church organization next Lord's Day. But I want to finish today with these concluding thoughts about the church and the gospel. The church is the extension of Jesus Christ's glorious life from heaven to his elect of every nation, every language, every color, all over the world. Have you ever wondered why the church exists or how it exists? It exists because Christ from heaven pours out his life onto the earth, into his people. The church lives because Christ lives. The church, Christians simply don't pop up on their own. They exist, as I say, they live because Christ, once again, has poured out his life from heaven into them and united them to his own flesh and blood body. They are his offspring. His, and, and this grace was given to them before time began. The Father always saw them in Christ. He loved them in Christ. What a blessing to be known before known and to be loved from the beginning of time till time never ending, to be loved in Christ, to be known in Him, not in ourselves, in our wretchedness and our sin, but in Christ and His pure and holy righteousness, uh, a righteousness that we could never have had from Adam. The very righteousness of God is given to us in Christ. And this grace is offered to the elect through the gospel, through the proclamation of the good news that the Son of God became a man so that he could pay the price for sin and open up heaven by the payment of his own life on the cross. Go to Jesus. Ask him to, to, to give you new and eternal life. It's a free gift to you, bought and paid for by his own suffering and death on the cross. Go to Jesus. You may ask, well, what if I'm not one of the elect? My friend, go to Jesus. He won't turn, anyway, he, he won't turn anyone away who comes to him. He will not. But you say, well, I'm a great sinner. Jesus Christ is a greater Savior who came to save sinners. Can I trust him, you ask? Will he really give me new life? Well, my friend, look around you. Look at the church. Look at the people who once were in darkness and under the power of Satan, but have been set free and now praise Jesus Christ for his grace. They declare to you that he is faithful. He is able. He is willing. Receive the grace that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, offers you. Do it today. Do it now. Ask him to change you and to give you the free gift, the free grace of eternal life. Jesus won't fail you. Perhaps he's calling you now and your heart is stirred. Go to him. Go to him. Amen. Let's pray. Now, Lord, we thank you for the words of scripture that reveal truth to us. Write these truths in our hearts. Use them to bring your elect to Christ, to save them out of sin and death, and to strengthen your church here on earth. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Hark the voice of love and mercy Sounds aloud from Calvary See it rends the rocks asunder Shakes the earth and veils the sky it is finished, it is finished, hear the dying Savior cry. It is finished, it is finished, hear the dying Savior cry. It is finished, oh what pleasure, do these charming words afford. Heavenly blessings without measure, flow to us from Christ the Lord. It is finished, it is finished, saints the dying words record. It is finished, it is finished, saints the dying words record. Finished all the types and shadows of the ceremonial law. Finished all that God had promised, death and 
and hell no more shall awe. It is finished, it is finished, saints from hands your comfort draw. It is finished, it is finished, saints from hands your comfort draw. Tune your harps anew, ye seraphs, join to sing the pleasing theme. Saints on earth and all in heaven, join to praise Emmanuel's name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, glory to the bleeding Lamb. 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 Hallelujah. Now receive your benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all now and forever. Amen.